Everyone loves bad gimmicks in wrestling, and WCW had some of the most ridiculous gimmicks in the history of our great sport. Coming up with characters and making everyone feel unique has always been just as important as what happens in the ring. I mean, if everyone looked the same, talked the same, had the same entrance music and wrestled the same, things would get pretty boring pretty fast, so a wrestler's persona becomes a key ingredient for success. Promoters and even the wrestlers themselves can sometimes get it wrong though, maybe they're out of touch, maybe they're thinking about it too hard, it could be a punishment or a rib, or maybe they've convinced themselves that whatever dumb gimmick they're trying to push on the fans is absolutely awesome and it's us fans who need to wake up and recognise greatness when it's right in front of our faces. Either way, some ridiculous characters have made it to our screens thanks to WCW and today we're going to take a look at a bunch of these gimmicks and we'll try to pinpoint what went wrong although I believe most of these will be painfully obvious. So let's get started, here's some truly awful WCW gimmicks and do keep in mind we're talking about the gimmicks here and not the men portraying the gimmicks. Some of these guys are great in the ring but this video focuses on characters. Robert Keelan portrayed the maestro in WCW, but what some of you may not know is that Robert was the grandnephew of Gorgeous George, a wrestling pioneer when it comes to character, charisma, flamboyance and self-promotion. Robert even wrestled as Gorgeous George III before arriving to WCW, but seeing as the company already had a Gorgeous George, Randy Savage's valet and girlfriend at the time, Robert would portray a new character in WCW. Gorgeous George III had a match on WCW Pro in October of 1997, but in 1999 the maestro was unleashed to unsuspecting and innocent viewers. Our guy would float around playing a piano, wasting WCW's money while the crowd looked on in sheer confusion. You can see the Gorgeous George similarities through the maestro gimmick, but this character wasn't going to win many world championships on the big stage, right? It's one of those characters that's destined for WCW Thunder, and indeed the maestro could be found on the WCW B show quite often. He would get himself a valet named Symphony, who many of you may know better as Ryan Shamrock from WWF, and he ended up in a feud that involved Ernest Miller and James Brown, as in THE James Brown. I'd imagine not too many fans were rushing out to buy maestro action figures, and I'd imagine WCW didn't even bother to put one out either. Still though, he made a lot of TV appearances, so fair dues I guess. Even to this day, I really don't think Brad Armstrong gets the recognition he deserves. He's one of the most underrated and underutilized talents in pro wrestling history. Brad was given quite a few questionable gimmicks, but none were as infamous as Arachnaman. Imagine a bootleg Spider Man action figure that's been altered just enough to avoid a lawsuit, and you've got Arachnaman, a yellow and purple version of Marvel's web slinging superhero that was supposed to appeal to very young viewers or very dumb old viewers. This blatant copying of a very well known superhero didn't go unnoticed by Marvel's legal team, and the comic book giant threatened to sue WCW for copyright infringement unless Arachnaman ceased to exist on WCW television, and he took his ass back to Web City. Yes, he was billed from Web City. It's kind of funny, really. The creative forces behind WCW really thought that changing Spider Man's colors and changing his name would be enough to avoid legal trouble, and it's also funny that they thought a Spider-Man clone would make for a good wrestling character. This won't be the last Jim Hurd creation in this video, I'm sure, but it's probably the most famous one. Many people have real trouble separating Disco Inferno the wrestler from Glenn Gilberti, the man portraying the character. Personally speaking, I like the Disco Inferno character and he's nowhere near as bad in the ring as what people make him out to be. He's no Bret Hart or Ricky Steamboat, but watching Nitro every week and watching the pay per views all over again for reliving the war has made myself and a lot of viewers break out of the echo chamber and realize that the popular narrative sometimes isn't true if you actually take the time to go back and take a closer look. I like the gimmick for how ridiculous it is, but it's also a gimmick that just doesn't sound right in a pro wrestling environment. As a matter of fact, it sounds absolutely terrible because it is terrible. Take Glenn out of the equation completely and think about it. A guy in the 90s obsessed with disco, a guy who wants to bring 70s disco dancing back to the masses while dressed like John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever. He struts, he dances, he has his own disco albums, he had a disco ball lower down during his entrances, he tried to get with the times by joining the wolf pack and later the filthy animals, but he could never get truly accepted because he was 
a goofball. It's actually remarkable that the Disco Inferno gimmick lasted throughout the entire Monday Night War period of pro wrestling, and I think a lot of that has to do with how Glenn portrayed the gimmick. There was a time when people understood that the character wasn't supposed to be taken seriously, believe it or not, and there were numerous times when fans got behind the Inferno. A lot of people don't like to admit that today, and they just totally ignore the undeniable proof available on WWE Network. Glenn's views and opinions don't resonate well with others. No one will ever say Disco Inferno was world champion material. His gimmick was comedically terrible, but it's the kind of terrible I enjoyed in the 90s. This is more of an NWA gimmick, but I couldn't put this video together without including Lasertron. Hector Guerrero hasn't had much luck when it comes to characters, with the gobbledygooker becoming one of the biggest jokes in WWF history. But before the gooker hatched from his giant egg, Hector portrayed Lasertron, a gimmick based on laser tag. Yeah, the 1986 toy where you and a friend put targets on your bodies and you run around with laser guns trying to shoot each other. Lasertron would have one of those targets on his chest, he'd wear a mask that had little antennas, and yeah, sometimes he'd carry a laser gun. It completely falls into that same category as Arachnaman really, you know? Kids love this shit, let's make a wrestler out of it, and again, like Arachnaman, it's a good wrestler getting stuck with something that's designed not to last too long. Now, to be fair, if you go back and look at comments from fans who enjoyed NWA wrestling on the Superstation, you'll see quite a few folks who enjoyed Lasertron, and Hector did introduce a lot of fans to Lucha Libre style wrestling, but the concept of the gimmick is still pretty ridiculous, sorry Lasertron marks. It's kind Kinda like one of those AI art programs that combines two opposite things to create monstrosities. Let's try it out actually. Uh, oh, oh shit, that's actually awesome. If Arachnaman and Lasertron were targeted towards children, then I don't know what the target audience for Big Josh was. Matt Bourne was best known for his Doink character in WWF, but before that he was Big Josh in WCW, a lumberjack who wrestled in a flannel, a red ski cap, and a pair of rolled up jeans. Was this supposed to target dudes who enjoyed the outdoors or something? I don't know, but you can't imagine a lumberjack getting involved in many storylines that would incorporate the character in meaningful ways, you know? Matt Bourne was a talented guy, a respected worker throughout the industry by most accounts, and WCW had him coming to the ring with bears that pissed themselves, what's that all about? Characters in wrestling can be mysterious, exciting, thought provoking, scary, funny, heroic, villainous, so what the fuck was Big Josh supposed to be? There's nothing remotely interesting nor exciting about this character, it's another one of those occupation gimmicks where the occupation selected is just lame, and it's not all that thrilling, it's kinda like a wrestling window cleaner or something, I don't know. Before Chavo Guerrero became Kerwin White, Barry Darso became Stuart Payne, based on golfer Payne Stewart. It seemed like Darso was given terrible gimmick after terrible gimmick once his days with demolition ended, but a golfer is the least intimidating person who could step in between the ropes. It boggles the mind to think there's more than one person out there who thinks a golf gimmick in wrestling is actually a good idea, or at least a somewhat entertaining idea. When real golfer Payne Stewart died in a Learjet crash, WCW decided to rename this character to, get this, Mr. Hole in One Barry Darso. So even if the original name was kinda clever, that part of the gimmick was taken away. This isn't a roll your eyes kind of gimmick where you get a little chuckle, this isn't a so bad it's good type of deal, this was just plain bad. Fans were forced to sit through Barry Darso's putting challenges and nobody cared, absolutely nobody cared. Think about it, if a golfer got up in your face, chances are you're gonna punch him without hesitation, there's nothing scary about a pro golfer. The WCW Yeti, you guys who watch this channel know who the Yeti is, but for those who don't, here's exactly what happened. The Dungeon of Doom brought a frozen Yeti to WCW Nitro and the big bastard escaped at the end of the show. At Halloween Havoc later in the week, the Yeti came down to the ring after Hulk Hogan lost the world championship, and to add insult to injury, the Yeti humped the Hulkster in the middle of the ring. When we saw the Yeti again, he was dressed up like a giant ninja, and that's the story of the Yeti. Good night and God bless. And the Yeti! And the Yeti! They call me the Shockmaster.
Sting and the British Bulldog reveal their partner for an upcoming War Games match on a flare for the gold at Clash of the Champions 24. Sting said this guy will shock the world, and boy did he ever. Big Fred Ottman breaks through the wall like the Kool Aid Man, and he fell in spectacular fashion. His glitter Stormtrooper helmet fell off, the other wrestlers on a flare for the gold laughed their asses off, and Ole Anderson, the guy doing the live voiceover for the Shockmaster, could be heard laughing as he tried to cut an intimidating promo. Everyone knows about this one, it's one of the greatest botches in wrestling history, but think about the character. A Stormtrooper helmet covered in glitter? Where's the correlation here with someone who's mastered the deadly arts of shocking? I probably would have got ripped apart if I didn't include the Shockmaster in this video, so there you have it. Legendary. We could have went through quite a few Ed Leslie WCW gimmicks here because each and every one is worth laughing at, but I'm going with the Booty Man, a wrestler who was obsessed with his rear end. I've heard this gimmick getting compared to Mr. Ass quite a lot in WWF, but there's a big difference here. Billy Gunn's Mr. Ass was an evolution of his badass Billy Gunn name, so it made sense. Ed Leslie, on the other hand, just showed up one week acting like a complete lunatic while shaking his hole about and pulling some insane faces. The Booty Man was another Hulk Hogan crony who would fight the good fight against the Dungeon of Doom and the Horsemen, but things got really unbelievable when Kimberly Page got the hots for Mr. Booty Man and she became his on screen valet and girlfriend, calling herself the Booty Babe. And look, I can suspend my disbelief for a lot of things in wrestling, but Kimberly Page getting it on with Ed Leslie is a step too far, good sir. The Booty Man's finishing move was the high knee, yeah that's clever isn't it? And as soon as this experiment failed, just like the Butcher in the Zodiac, Ed Leslie would become Hollywood Hogan's disciple. He was already his little disciple in real life, so that gimmick probably fit better than all the rest. I've heard people say they liked this gimmick, but if you look hard enough you'll find people who liked every gimmick in this video, so it's hardly surprising. Lance Storm revealed on Twitter that Mike hated this gimmick because of the attire he had to wrestle in during his matches, so if the talent portraying the gimmick isn't behind it then it's just not gonna work. Still, Mike was told to do a job and he had to try and make the most of it. It's pretty damaging too because many consider Mike Awesome as one of the most underused wrestlers in history and a guy who deserves so much more than what he got. He left ECW because the checks were bouncing and he had mouths to feed, he went to WCW where he became that 70s guy and also the fat chick thriller, and quite simply, WCW fans didn't get to see the Mike Awesome that others knew from ECW and even Japan. Also, it was reported that Awesome Awesome was offered a WWF contract at the same time he was offered his WCW contract, and Paul Heyman tried to sway Mike into going to New York, but Mike wanted the bigger money being offered by WCW, so who knows what could have been. Make no mistake about it, the Renegades character was completely based on a WWF superstar. Hulk Hogan needed some backup heading into Uncensored 95 where he was scheduled to take on Vader. Hogan promised fans a quote, ultimate surprise and a silhouette was shown of this ultimate surprise in the run up to the pay per view. To be fair, Hogan did say his name was the Renegade, but there may have been younger fans who were maybe still unsure. It uncensored, the Renegade made his proper WCW debut, and yeah, it's a bad take on Jim Helwig. The general look, the mannerisms, the theme music, it's like your parents saying, we have got the ultimate warrior at home. The Renegade was chewed up and spat out in terms of both his association with Hulk Hogan and his status in WCW. He would get a couple of pay per view matches and a few Nitro appearances, but he was soon relegated to the C shows, and eventually he would become nothing more than a job guy on Monday nights. Gimmicks that rip off other characters have actually worked in the past, Demolition ripping off the Road Warrior springs to mind, and of course there's always the whole Nature Boy fiasco, but the Renegade in WCW felt like a cheap ploy. There's something a little unsettling now when you look back at John Laurinaitis and Shane Douglas portraying the dynamic dudes. It's like they're trying to be hip with all these kids, but why? <laughs> you know, like, why? No grown ass man should learn how to skateboard when approaching 30 while also wearing luminous baseball caps and bright shorts. I don't care who you are, that's fucking creepy. We should have known there was something dodgy about that Laurinaitis guy all the way back in the late 80s. So here you go skateboarding fans and beach bums of the era too, this is your representation, Johnny Ace in the franchise, the living embodiment of the fellow kids meme. 
I made a whole WCW blunder episode on Oz, so if you want to learn more, check that upload out. But in short, Kevin Nash portrayed not the Wizard of Oz, just Oz, the great and powerful Oz, but not the Wizard of Oz. Nash argued that Oz was a geographical region, but WCW couldn't care less. It was time to make a tie-in with the Wizard of Oz, so Big Kev put on his stupid mask and he went out there to complete silence. You've also got Kevin Sullivan as the wizard, again not the Wizard of Oz, just a random wizard. You've got his pet monkey that died the night of Oz's debut. And you've got Big Sexy in his emerald tights looking incredibly uncomfortable, a surefire recipe for success. In saying all this though, the Oz character was way more popular in Japan. Fans over there couldn't get enough of this giant clusterfuck, but fans in the states and practically everywhere else weren't into it. Thankfully, Vinny Vegas, Nash's next gimmick, was much better, and I don't care what anyone says, Vinny Vegas was good, and that character won't be featured in our video today. Big John Tenta portrayed Earthquake in WWF and when he jumped to WCW he became Avalanche. The WWF felt that was borderline gimmick infringement brother so Avalanche became the shark. Nothing was subtle about the shark, he had shark teeth painted on his face, his theme music was inspired by that classic Jaws track and he used his hand like a fin when walking down to the ring and he wanted to take a bite out of his opponents. Well he didn't really but let's just pretend he did. Tenta and WCW eventually learned that the shark wasn't going anywhere, so John came out and cut a promo where he said he's not a real shark. Surprise, surprise. He's just a man, a man named John Tenta. Tenta would then wrestle under his real name, but things didn't get much better when Big Bubba Rogers started shaving his head and his facial hair. Had Tenta remained an underwater shark, then maybe that wouldn't have happened. It's always the one that gets brought up when people talk about Jim Hurd, and for good reason too. The Ding Dongs. Ding and Dong, or Ding Dong 1 and Ding Dong 2. They had bells around their ankles, bells around their wrists, they had their own personal bell in the corner, because they liked to ring bells, I don't know. Jim Hurd thought this was money, but the fans in attendance and even Jim Ross on commentary thought otherwise during their debut. Again, this was supposed to appeal to kids, and it falls so flat on its face that it makes you wonder what kind of kids Jim Hurd and company actually knew. I mean, were there focus groups for this kind of shit? Because I can't imagine any kid being excited for the Ding Dongs. You'd probably get laughed at in the playground if you said the Ding Dongs are my favourite tag team. Again, I talked about this one in WCW Blunder, but in short, the demon became a thing because apparently Gene Simmons wanted it to be a thing. Kiss and WCW would work together to put on a Kiss concert on WCW programming, and a deal was struck where a Kiss inspired wrestler would work on shows, and get this, a main event on pay per view was also promised. This was avoided by putting the demon match on the middle of the card, and the commentators just said it was a main event. Dale Torberg, the guy who played the demon, comes across as a real nice guy, and on top of that, he was a big fan of Kiss. He wanted the gimmick to work, but this is one of those ideas that you just know from the planning stage that it's gonna suck. If you loved Kiss, you might have got something out of this. For everyone else though, it was another bad WCW idea, and one of the dumbest partnership deals the company ever struck up. There's more to this one though, so check out that blunder video. He blocks roads? What's the deal with this one? There's an urban legend floating around that Hulk Hogan dismissed Roadblock in a gym when Mr. Block asked Hogan how do you get into the wrestling business. Later that night, according to legend, Roadblock jumped the guardrail, he chased down Hogan's opponent that night, the one man gang, and he pinned gang to the mat before getting arrested. Sounds like absolute bullshit, but it's a story that's out there. Apparently, after this brave showing, the Hulkster got Roadblock a job. <laughs> yeah, this is bullshit. The gimmick's a strange one, but I guess no one likes a Roadblock. There's nothing worse than sitting in traffic while a giant mammoth of a man blocks the way. Roadblock would get a few matches on WCW Nitro, but his main home was on WCW Saturday Night for a while, where he continued to carry his sawhorse to the ring while not exactly exciting fans, let's be honest. The guy could move for someone his size, but well, he's a roadblock, a walking, talking, wrestling roadblock. 
That's gonna do it for this one. I made a list of around 50 gimmicks and we only got through around 16 or 17 today, so let me know what others you want to see in part 2. Maybe you enjoyed some of these gimmicks and characters in today's video and it's great if you did. Wrestling characters can resonate with different people in different ways, so if you were a big Ding Dongs guy or if you thought the Yeti was nothing but wasted potential then let me know. As mentioned, I like the Disco Inferno of all gimmicks so there's no shame in liking some some of the more ridiculous things in pro wrestling, it's supposed to be fun. But thanks for watching guys and thanks for putting up with my bad throat, I'm, I'm sure you noticed it again and it's really really sore to talk but I hope you enjoyed this look at some of the most awful gimmicks in WCW history and please take care. Thanks to everyone who supports Wrestling Bios on Patreon. A few guys who signed up at the Hall of Fame level include Jared Thuman, Joshua Antal and Occupy Pro Wrestling. You can find Occupy on Twitter and YouTube at the links on your screen right now. A big thank you to these Hall of Famers and a big thanks to all the names you see on your screen right now for supporting on Patreon.